Hello everyone and welcome to this week's video. I'm doing this little mini series over the month of October where I talk about some of the bugs that I found and share some stories. None of the bugs that I found are particularly like super complex or technical. Actually quite a lot of the bugs I find are more like business logic errors and issues like we'll be covering today where it's a lot simpler. And that means I can't really fill an entire video with one story because my bugs are not that impressive. So instead I'm combining three stories and talking about them and hopefully you'll find it interesting and helpful. And you'll also see that quite a lot of bug hunting is not really technically complex. So this one's called Your Technical Debt Is My Bug Bounty because that's what the original talk I presented this for a few conferences at was called. And I really like the title because I thought it sounded very professional and big thought leadership and look at me, I'm a professional security person, I know what I'm doing. So I'm keeping it because I worked hard on that joke. So before we do anything else though, we need to thank today's sponsor. And we do in fact very kindly have a sponsor. As somebody who loves to share free security resources, I'm really excited to share Fetch the Flag. It's a free virtual capture the flag hosted by Sneak, the sponsor, and fellow YouTube creator, John Hammond. The CTF kicks off at 9 a.m. Eastern time on October 27th and runs for a full 24 hours until October 28th at 9 a.m. So you can play for as long or as little as you like. You can invest your time. It doesn't matter so much what time zone you're in as well. There's going to be 30 challenges across various domains, including web security, cloud security, binary exploitation. And this is a really good opportunity to learn new skills. In fact, the first vulnerability I'm going to talk about today is about GraphQL. And I never would have looked at GraphQL if it wasn't for a CTF. And it's probably one of the things I find the most vulnerabilities in. Cloud security, great one to do. When I was working at BugCrad, I saw so many cloud security vulnerabilities. It's a great skill to learn. The three highest scoring teams will also win a Nintendo Switch. It's for all levels of players with challenges ranging from beginner to advanced. And if you're new to CTF, they're actually running a CTF 101 workshop on October 18th, where you can solve practice challenges and you'll have like hands on, you'll get live support. So that way you know what to expect and you can really get started with the CTF on game day. It's a great way to challenge your security skills and even learn a thing or two. So gather your team and register using my link, which is on screen in the video description. It's sneak.co forward slash CTF dash insider PhD. So that's sneak.co slash CTF dash insider PhD to let them know that you came from my videos. Thank you so much to Sneak for sponsoring this video. Um, if I can, I am also going to compete, even if it's just for a single challenge. So I'll see you all there. Okay, so our first story I've called Read the Docs. This is probably one of the only security vulnerabilities that I think I could do an entire video on how I found it, because it's actually very cool. And I am very impressed with myself for finding it. And it's really interesting. So I'm not going to go fully in depth. I'm going to brush over it a little bit. But if you do want a full video on how I found this, please just tell me and I will make it. But I don't think it would be very interesting, which is why I haven't. This is a story about how I figured out not just the exact software version that this particular client was using, but of a dependency. And not just of the dependency. Oh, no. The dependency of the dependency, literally with just API requests. I am so proud of myself for this one, like genuinely. Okay, so GraphQL. I'm pretty sure that by now anyone who regularly watches my content probably knows what GraphQL is. I talk, talk about it a few times and I'd be really surprised if you didn't, to be honest, because you're watching my YouTube channel. This is one of the main things I talk about. You'd hope you know what this is. So GraphQL is a type of API and it's a type of API that rather than having individual endpoints for each kind of request you make, you instead have a single endpoint which you then send a query to or a mutation. Mutations update it, queries refetch data. 
And these queries can be quite complicated. You can have requests, not just parameters, but you can also request relationships. So you can get the relationship between two, in this case, the name, then you can get the posts, and then you can request the title of the post of the user. So you can have these really in-depth queries very easily without having to write a lot of business logic. They always take in and return JSON. So they're really easy to spot because they have literally the word query or the word mutation in the request. That's how I can tell. They're also often just called GraphQL. So they, it doesn't require anything special, basically. So when I was testing this particular client, I ended up just experimenting it. I always spend the first few hours of any kind of hacking just looking at what's in front of me and trying to understand what's this being used for? How are you supposed to use this? What kind of security controls are in place? And then I'm thinking, okay, how can I break those security controls? As I was testing this, I saw something really unusual and that is a multi-part form. Now, if you're familiar at all with web security, you know that multi-part forms are not that unusual. They're actually very common. That's very common for uploading images. And really, this kind of wasn't surprising. But when I went into the multi-part form, I realized that it was sending the GraphQL. And this is unusual. Usually with GraphQL, you just see like a GET request. It's very unusual to see GraphQL being used in the multi-part form. So unusual, I'd never seen it before. And there's a reason why, because it's rare. It's this rare kind of way of looking at GraphQL. So this is what it looks like. I'm just gonna turn on my little laser pointer. So the first part of the query or the, the multi-part form has the query in it. And here you can see that the query is then just a JSON but then this is the actual GraphQL. So in this case, it's a mutation, which takes in a file parameter, which then looks for an upload. And you can see that this is being provided by the single upload thing here. Typical GraphQL. Now what's interesting is that the file here um, is null, but it's also in this second thing called variables. Okay, not too unusual for GraphQL. Then the second part of the form here has this structure so it has what's called a map and it says zero is variables dot file down here you can see the final part with zero with a file name that then has the whatever file content is in it this is really unusual and show you the links here this is the link between variables and files this is the name so essentially it's saying hey this part of the multi-part form is what's going to populate the variables dot file variable right which is then going to be used in here where it says file so this is fairly unusual for me and i hadn't ever seen this before so i had to ask myself does this actually exist is this a thing and it was a thing so there's this idea that's floating around the graphql community of this multi-part form but it's like a specification. This is not standard in every library. And so it was really easy to go in here and say, oh, okay, so the GraphQL multi-part request form is only really supported by a few servers. And depending on what language, you may only have one server that actually works with, right? So I caused an error. I didn't intentionally cause an error. I actually did it by mistake. But what I got from it was a Java error. Oh, okay, so this server is running Java. This isn't necessarily a security flaw, right? Error messages don't necessarily mean security issue. But once I'd realized, oh, this is Java, I could very quickly narrow down the options because there was only one. There was only one GraphQL Java servlet that actually implemented this GraphQL multi-part form. So, what do we do when we find the exact versions? We go there, we go into GitHub and we go through the issues and we search CVE and security and vulnerability and a bunch of other like super, super like 
obvious noob searches. Anyway, so I found this kind of discussion here on the Maven repository, which was reporting that was 48 vulnerabilities from Jackson Databind. Now, this, as you can see, this user misunderstood what Maven was talking about. And in fact, I also misunderstood it the first time I saw it. It's an older version on Maven. However, by seeing, okay, this runs Jackson Databind, I could then jump into Jackson Databind. Now, Jackson Databind has quite a lot of vulnerabilities and it's all specific versions. So essentially what I then did is tried to find regular software vulnerabilities to start to narrow down the versions. So I'm going to use an example of like a string. Maybe a string is passed with a, in a specific way uh, on version one, but not on version two. If the string passes the same way, you know it can't be any higher than version two because it got fixed. So I wasn't necessarily looking for security bugs. I was trying to narrow down the GraphQL uh, Jackson data bind version that they were using. Anyway, so I did anyway, so I did all of that and found this particular vulnerability which caused the it was basically like the JSON could only serialize to a specific level and I could cause the same vulnerability. It's not a very interesting vulnerability. It paid out two grand, so it's not like the best vulnerability. But I thought it was really interesting and I had fun finding it. Next story, thinking crud. So this is all about API hacking. So create, read, update, delete. In a RESTful API, you have this very defined structure. It can change a little bit between different clients but only for delete and put. And if you want more information on that, I have like API hacking videos you can look at, so I won't bore you with it. But essentially it has this defined RESTful structure. Get API slash resource name gets all of the resources. If you add an ID to the end of it, it gets just the one resource. Post will always create a new one. Put will edit one, etc. And that is the defined RESTful structure. Now, a lot of the time in CRUD, when we start to think about create, read, update, delete, we can start to think about these icons here. So you can view something, you can edit something, or you can delete something. And we're going to stay on view and edit here because when I was testing this, I was able to populate a form. Uh, here's a nice editable form and I wasn't able to submit the form. Even though I had the cross user, I wasn't able to get one user to submit the same form. It was giving me a 403 error. But I realized looking at the actual form that it has all of the details in it. It has all of the details in the form. And it says you're just filling out this form, whatever. And so what if a video is private? If a video is private or like a resource is private and you shouldn't be able to see it, but it's populating the form, even though you can't save it and submit it, you're still able to break the access control because the access control, when you make something private, means only you can see it. So this population of the details, you can see here, title and description, because it's on YouTube. This is what I was able to see for private videos. Couldn't submit it, wouldn't work, but that doesn't mean there's not a security issue and access control issue there. So my final story for you is called Quizzical. And this is really a story of balancing performance against security constraints. So if you ever work with mobile apps, you'll become very familiar with quite a few different ways that developers actually use mobile apps. But in this case, I was testing an app that was essentially a quiz app. You had quizzes, you could answer quizzes and you get points for doing good at quizzes not a huge like you might think not a huge kind of scope there for actually hacking there was user accounts and you could put in some details but actually i think most people would look at that and say there's not enough stuff to actually hack there there's just nothing right and so i think a lot of people ended up looking over this app but i stuck with it i had a look and the interesting thing about how phones work is that they have this essential problem, which is that any application on a form needs on a phone needs to optimize the network access. 
they cannot always be like transferring data off of every few minutes because it can actually be a bad source of battery drain and multiple requests will keep on having that antenna as active so instead people try and make their their apis more efficient by using something called batching now paypal is a great example of this and how it works but essentially instead of sending two requests you send one request which tells the server to send two requests on your behalf And I know it's a bit confusing, so I'll show it over here. So this is from PayPal's API. We have operations and then we have method and path. So this is making a post request to version one checkout orders with these headers and with this body. And it's the same here. So this is only a single request, but it's going to do multiple things at once. And then it's going to send them back to us. Great. Cool. Very common. Now, back to the question answer app they had this kind of structure so it sent back an id the type of question it was and then the question what's the capital of the uk who is this famous celebrity what is the most grossing movie of all time whatever right and then it came back with the options paris berlin london which one is correct the other thing it sent was which one is the correct answer because again we want to optimize network access So if you go in here, you could essentially go, London is the correct answer because I can see that because the the API has told me that. So it makes for a really interesting um, kind of bug here, business logic error, because you can predict which one of these is the correct answer. The only problem is that you need then need some automation behind it to actually show this is exploitable and uh, you can actually use it to form an attack which was the kind of difficult part of that particular bug was turning that into viable automation Um, the other interesting thing is that you could submit your uh, points for prizes and they weren't like super valuable prizes but they were prizes and that is a business logic error my tldr of today's video is that apis are vulnerable that's it that's the tweet you should hack them because they're a great place to actually start to find bugs, especially if you're still struggling to find your own first bug. But thank you everyone. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. Do not forget about today's sponsor, Sneak. You can sign up with my link on the screen, sneak.co slash CTF dash insider PhD. It's in the video description. It's a free CTF. It's going to be a great fun. So I hope to all see you there and I will see you all in the next video. Bye everyone.